Team of Talk is a BS-free zone with smart, funny and educational conversations with entrepreneurs and business owners sharing their stories and insights designed to help you succeed. The result is a video vault of wisdom, strategies and tactics on how to grow your business by increasing revenue, reducing costs and amplifying your market share. Welcome to Team of Talk, the B2B show created to help entrepreneurs and CEOs succeed. Here is your host, business growth architect and founder of Tima, Carl M. Gibbons. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Tima Talk, the fast-paced BS-free zone with smart, fun, and educational conversations with entrepreneurs, business owners, and executives who have all come together to share their stories and insights designed to help you succeed. Uh, joining us today is Rafael Feliciano, who is the president of the Food Ideas Group. The Food Ideas Group is a marketing and PR company primarily focused at the restaurant and hospitality sector down here in South West Florida. Rafael, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you so much. You said that uh, you said that too good. I might have to hire you, see if you can do some, <laughs> get your voice recording on some stuff. Well, we'll, 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 we'll talk about that offline, right? <laughs> 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 All right, man. So listen, um, coronavirus, pandemic, um, two words that anybody in the, in the restaurant industry, that must be like garlic to a vampire, right? I mean, yeah. they just don't want to hear those two words. I don't think I'm, under, I'm understating things or underplaying things. If I say that particularly down here in Southwest Florida, it's just decimated um, the hospitality and the restaurant industry. But would that be a fair statement to make? I think that would be more than a fair statement because the reality is in Southwest Florida, you know, especially being a, a, an area in which we have so many transients, the reason people come down here, yes, the living, yes, the beaches, but without the restaurant and bars and the hospitality scene, what else do we have much of, you know? Right. I mean, this is Restaurant Town USA. Right. But the part of the reason why we have a great social atmosphere, why the older demographic like coming down here is that hospitality environment because it, it's connected so directly to tourism, so directly to travel. And without that industry flourishing, that's a huge hurt to our economy. I've been saying this for a very long time. You know, the reason why, in addition to other things, but on the business side of it and the economics, why I love hospitality, why I love restaurants, is because if you go into any city and the restaurant scene is healthy and doing very well, that means that the economy is doing well because people don't spend money in restaurants unless they have the extra money to spend. Right. It's a leisure sport. You know, it's, 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 it's one of those things. And I think hospitality, Southwest Florida in general, we just got caught with our pants down, you know, with our pants down in the sense of, you know, our mar people are starting to understand margins are thin in the industry. You know, people are much more leveraged than you thought they were. And it's, it's changing a lot of things. It's been very hurtful to see this because you have a lot of restaurateurs who, I mean, this is their livelihoods. And then you have some hobbyists that kind of jumped into the restaurant scene because they thought, I want, oh, it's, you know, this is fun. This is this. And, and the reality is, I don't know how many doors are going to reopen if this goes into May 1st or if this goes into June 1st or what some are predicting September, October. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a terrible situation. Right. Well, I, I think that uh, nobody foresaw the sort of the perfect storm coming. Now, we all knew, or we should have, any, any business owner of any repute should have seen that there was going to be another realignment of the economy. That always comes along. That uh, we, we had one in 2007. We were due another one. I was predicting Q3 of this year, funnily enough, but hey, we're in it right now. Um, mm -hmm. But nobody could have uh, seen the, the Russian uh, and, and Saudi oil scenario going on. Then you throw in the coronavirus and it's like the perfect storm. It's literally the perfect storm. It's just like some kind of world war going on all, all at once. And, and so um, I, 
nobody could have foreseen that coming. Um, I, I have I have no sympathy with anybody, whether they're a, a restaurant or any business, if they're over leveraged, if they got caught with their pants down, because that's just frankly bad management. But let's let's not let's not dwell on that. Um, give me some of the um, g give me some of the. Let's start off with the horror stories we'll come on to the, the creative ways that people are getting around it. But share with us some of the horror stories that, uh, that you've seen over the last uh, month, six weeks, and how quickly it took a hold and, and, and tore these businesses apart. Well, okay. So before we talk about the horror stories, I want, the one thing I want to touch on is, so it's, it is like a perfect storm globally. But another thing is, and we don't know how the future is going to hold, but think about it like this. Southwest Florida on top of the perfect storm on a, on a global scale, they also have two factors that one might hit and one was part of it. So they got hit five times rather than three times. Okay. Now, when I say that is because a lot of people, I think they understand it, but for those that don't, you know, this happened, we started hearing about this late February where it became prominent. And then March, we closed down two extremely vital months for hospitality in a very seasonal area. So restaurants that, you know, normally take a break in the summer, they cut their hours, cut their staff, relying on February, March, and a lot of April, because these restaurants, business in general, not even just restaurants, but a lot of businesses, they re they're relying on that business that they do to get them through the summer into next season. Right. Now, so what you're saying, if, 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 if literally th this thing would have hit down three months later, it might have not been that bad. Right. It might not be. It's like when Irma hit, you know, it was extremely tough. Yeah. And, but, and we got over it together as a community, but Irma was in that September, October range where, you know what, that it, it didn't affect restaurants as much because that's September is historically our slowest downturn right. of the we, season. We literally had time to, to clean up and get absolutely, out. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it set us up for an extremely successful season because people all over the United States that come here, the Midwesterners, the Northeasterners, they're like, you know what, I can't wait to go to Southwest Florida and spend the money put it back into the economy. So now you have the three, the three global, you know, crisis that happen out of this. Then yeah. you have it hitting us in season, season. in a seasonal area. Yeah. And we can't really, you know, we can't predict this, but hopefully we have a light hurricane season because right. now it, a lot of restaurants and businesses are like, okay, when this opens back up, people have been, you know, have been cooped up in their houses. They're ready to go out. Maybe we'll have a strong summer off season. Maybe. But if we get hit with a hurricane, we're going to go back to back to back to back to back five times in a row. And that is the absolute worst case scenario, I think, or a second wave pandemic of Corona breaking out. So before, you know, I just want to mention that is, you know, Southwest Florida got hit additionally right. to what's already getting going on globally. Yeah. Um, as far as horror stories, I mean, it's, you know, I could pick in some restaurants individually, but I'll say the no, biggest no, no, horror I, story. Yeah. The biggest horror story is okay. I would say that people to fathom this, you have to be in it and you have to see and you have to kind of like look at it from a ten thousand scope view. Most people that live paycheck to paycheck, that's bi weekly, maybe weekly. Hospitality people, they're living night by night, shift by shift tip by tip. I remember when I was a bartender, I was 21, 22 years old, you know, it, I would go in on Friday night and rent would be due on Monday. And I'm like, I got three days to, to make 1500 bucks, you know, yeah. and you would just be grinding it on two doubles and a, and a Sunday shift. Yeah. And, you know, during a lot of the hospitality people, they look at season, just like the restaurants, this is where I'm going to make my money. I can pay my rent in the summer months. And then, you know, I can, you know, this is how I live my life. That's just the lifestyle they have. You have so many hospitality people that don't know when their next meal is, you know, don't know what they're going to do in the summer, unemployed, haven't received unemployment money yet. I mean, I, I'm a very avid supporter of supporting the first responders and everything the front line is doing for us. But I'm also an advocate too of the people that lost their jobs that are in hospitality that rely on, because if you live in Southwest Florida, as many restaurants that we have, just think of the people that work in those restaurants. There's, right. there's so many people that keep this, this boat you know, sailing. 
I think that's the biggest horror story. Also, too, the second story, I guess the second notion is it's not talked about a lot, but if you, you know, Anthony Bourdain, he committed suicide. He really highlighted mental health and hospitality. Mental health is a, or I'm sorry, hospitality is a sector of business in which your job, my job as a hospitality person is to put a smile on my face every day. No matter what problems I have going on in my life, you leave your baggage at the door and yeah. you have to service people. And sometimes it's easy. Sometimes it's tough. You know, sometimes you get yelled at and it's not always the greatest experience, but now you, and, and also with chefs, I mean, chefs historically work 60 to 70 hours a week. You, know, you don't really get into the restaurant industry to be rich. We don't know any rich chefs. We know rich, we, we know wealthy restaurant owners maybe, but chefs, it's an industry. It's like being a, an, a painter, being an artist. You're a creator. You're a curator. Um, I think that right now with, a, and I've heard, there's been a few throughout the United States and a few here in Southwest Florida, there's been some, some deaths. There's been some, you know, what they've been saying are suicides. You have people in the mental health or in this industry. Where, where it's pushed them over the edge. It's pushed you know? them a little bit, you know, and right. then you're not working. You don't know what the future holds. So I think those are the two tragedy type topics I would say that is, um, that has come from this, right. but there's always the silver lining too. Right. Well, any, any loss of life is tragic, right? Always. That, 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 that's a given. I don't care whether it's from always. coronavirus, somebody who sadly takes their own life or somebody that loses it. It doesn't matter what it is. A loss of life is a sad loss of life for everybody. Yeah. Um, but our, our audience is, is predominantly, uh, you know, entrepreneurs and business owners. And so um, talk to us a little bit about how they have been dealing with, and, and like I said, some of the challenges that they've had to deal with immediately. I, I, I totally understand and, and have sympathy with the, the challenges that their employees have had. But let's, sure. look, at it, let's look at it from a, a business owner's perspective. So from a business owner's perspective, on the, on the, on the negative side, you know, <laughs> Unfortunately, and you know, whether it's mismanagement or however you want to call it, uh, restaurants don't have as much funding and reserves as they should for things like this. But also in their defense, I, 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 yesterday I had a meeting with um, Jonathan Kling, the CNO, of, uh, uh, the CNO for NCH. And we were talking about it that just most businesses in their crisis plan it doesn't have something that says, how do you prepare for something that's going to shut the world down? Right. You know? So I think on the positive side, business owners have been forced to get back into their business. Um, I talked to a restaurant owner last week and she said, uh, one of the great things about this is that she's now in her, she's forced to be in her restaurant every day because, you know, she had to cut labor. She, you know, she has to, and she's starting to see things that she's like, you know what? I was doing good before, but I realized that doing good was just scratching the surface. I could be doing so much better. My right. margins could have been better. So right. you have more involved owners. Right. Uh, I think that is absolutely fantastic. I think you're also seeing a lot of business owners, uh, especially the restaurant owners, they're starting to communicate with each other because this isn't no longer a all a, a dog, every dog for themselves. Right. This is how can we get through this together? Right. And the reason why I think that's important is because a very thriving hospitality scene, New York, Chicago, you know, Raleigh, North Carolina, Charleston, South Carolina, places where food makes it also part of the destination. Right. The restaurants there understand that if you're successful and I'm successful, this is good for the area. We're, we're all successful. We're all successful. And I'll be very honest with you. That's not always been the case here in Southwest Florida. And it's forced us to work together. It's forced us to collaborate. Veranda E at Escalante Hotel. And, and I'm, I'm only plugging them because of what they did. So there is... Um, they, their, their restaurant was closed. Uh, they on, they're only serving from dinner from five to nine. Well, they have an empty restaurant for, you know, the first half of the day. They teamed up with a bakery and did a pop-up bakery so that, so to give use to their kitchen, but also to help someone else in business. Right. If that's not collaboration, I mean, I, I don't know what else. I think it's an excellent oh. idea. I yeah. mean, most people, when they when they hit this challenge, and I found it interesting that you said about people don't have a, uh, a, 
a reserve plan or a backup plan or a, uh, I think it's now those that don't, I think it's going to be a part of every business owner's business plan going forward. I, I think there's a huge amount of lessons that have been learned here. And I think the ones that did have, have a contingency plan and nobody's putting the words coronavirus in play in the, into the contingency plan, but they did have a, a what if a reserved funds or whatever. Um, I think they will obviously cope a lot better, but most of us, are very especially entrepreneurs and business owners we're very resilient um we we, we we have a creative approach to things so that you, you're talking about the the, the pop-up bakery was in a, a a great um example of that what others what what other examples of of creative approaches have you seen i think um well uh, a really creative approach has been so there's two restaurants i saw do this specifically um, in Fort Myers, there's a restaurant called The Standard, and then there's a restaurant here called The Founders, which is extremely new. They were only open two weeks before Corona hit, and both restaurants immediately understood that, you know, closing down restaurants means their employees needed something. So they created um, employee like refuge funds where they're starting to take in money and they're able to uh, take in donations, taking contributions. They're either feeding their employees that don't have jobs right now so that they don't have to worry about food or they're actually taking care of them financially. And so they're doing the best thing there. I thought that's, I think that's amazing. Right. I know there's a lot of big uh, national companies that are doing it, but you know, when you deal with a national, not that it's not to knock it, but when you deal with local, you can get it faster. You know, there's a lot less loopholes. So I think that's been very important. Um, I, uh, I also saw that, uh, a lot of restaurants like Brian Roland, everyone knows Brian Roland, uh, Vicenzo, downtown Naples, yeah. uh, even the, you know, even the restaurants that I mentioned, they started offering pantry items, which I didn't understand the value of that till it happened to me. So I was in Publix. And what, and what does that mean? For, for a, so this, so, well, this is what it means. So imagine you're in Publix, like I was in Publix and there was a lot of people there. And if you're really, if you're really taking social distance seriously, you're looking at all these people and you kind of have anxiety, right? Wow. And then you see people touching foods, putting it back down. I end up leaving, and this was right when things were really hot, when it first, when it first became news. So everyone was a little concerned. I went, I left, right? So uh, what the restaurants that are doing to offer pantry items means that, let's say you need toilet paper, you need bleach, you need cleaning supplies or you need flour because you're cooking at home. You need groceries from Immokalee. Not only, you don't have to order from their restaurant a dish, you can go on their menu and you can order these items and it can get delivered to you. Or it can be ready curbside delivery, curbside pickup. And I thought that was absolutely genius because now someone like me who might've been nervous about it or an older, an older person, a senior that you know is already concerned, I, I think that really helped uh, you, it, there was a void and they create and that void create an opportunity, which resulted into that. I thought that was amazing. Um, I've also seen uh, a few, a uh, few hotels open up their doors to seniors in the community. You know, we have Moorings Park. We have, you know, um, I'm having, uh, I'm having a brain lapse, but there's, we have a lot of senior communities where what's the whole premise of a senior community. It's socialization, it's gathering. So if you're in that community and maybe, something breaks out or you're just nervous or let's say you're a husband and wife that lives up north and your mom lives here well you want to get them away for a week you know these hotels are opening their doors up for specific causes like that i thought that's been very interesting um i also saw a nonprofit organization blue zones yeah. uh david longfield and blue zones you know they're they're taking their access of restaurants and they're getting they're doing they're using gift cards and they're selling them to people that is to be used later on in the year when this right. is over. So that's important to me because even the restaurants that we work with on a client basis and those that we just care about, I think the most important thing is not, yes, of course, let's get through this time, but let's plan for the future. Let's start thinking about the upward slope of this. Let's not just keep, you know, not doggy paddling, just trying to tread water, thinking ahead is what's also going to get us through. So those are some of the things I saw that have been very right. creative, innovative. So, so talking about the future, how do you see it on the other side? How long do you think 
the specter of um, the pandemic, the coronavirus is going to be with us. And what do you think life is going to be like in the hospitality industry on the other side? And when do you think the other side will come? Man, uh, it's tough, right? So I think that there's no right answer to this. So this is a speculation. And thankfully, you know, I've been able to talk to a lot of great people in the health field, you know, CNOs and a lot of hospitals and stuff. So this is just based on a, everyone I've talked to and what I see going on. I think that if May 1st, May 5th, if, if May happens and we're able to go back to normal, that means it's a new normal. It's a new reality because I don't imagine people going, just running out of their doors, trying to sit next to each other in a bar right. or shaking hands and hugging and kissing. Um, There's going to be a transitional phase yeah. until, and that's going to, and I think that's going to take 90 days at least because in the summer we're kind of used to just, the locals are just used to kind of being on their own and getting their time and space. So it's easy, but when season comes, it's going to be hard to stay at home. And I think this season, if every, if, if Corona really is done in May and June, I think this season, we're going to have a strong season. Um, as far as the new reality and moving forward, here's what I think is very interesting. And it, it applies to all businesses, whether retail hospitality or the ones that have engaging type industries. So I think the new reality is the consumer, you and me, that goes and dines at the restaurant, we are going to be digesting information differently. We're going to be looking for different things that we've never looked at before, things that we've never thought we'd care about a year, a year ago. I think the restaurants that are in their marketing, in their marketing, are talking about how clean they are, you know, how, you know, going up and beyond in sanitation, you know, instead of just sweeping this under the rug, owning into this, because consumers don't like feeling like they're being lied to. They want to feel, they want to be very, they want you to be transparent. So be transparent. Talk about your cleanliness. Talk about, you know, your, uh, where you're getting your food from. Talk about, you know, what you're doing with your food. Talk about your practices. And I think if you and I were looking and we're trying to pick a restaurant for the night, and, you know, we both have two restaurants that serve really good food, and we know that, but you see one that's going up and beyond talking about how they're trying to make you feel safe and clean in their restaurant, we're probably going to lean towards them moving forward. And right. it's just a part of marketing. Who, who would have thought we would have said that? Right. So I think the consumers are going to be digesting information differently. And I think businesses, hospitality, and retail are going to have to include this in their market plans. And the second thing that I think is the most important is I've heard from a lot of restaurants that the safety isn't just in the consumer dining at the restaurant. The safety is for their staff as well. So I, uh, a few restaurants have already said that no matter when the, the social distancing and the stay at home order is lifted, that they're going to continue curbside and delivery and stay closed for at least a few months. Now, it's interesting because most fine dining restaurants and Naples has a heavy fine dining um, yep. caliber yes. of dining. Yep. Most fine dining restaurants do not rely on curbside takeout or delivery right. as part of their revenue stream. Right. The new reality is if you want to be successful in this environment, you need to own into that, be creative with it. You need to be able to sell foods that travel well. Because right. sometimes the best foods, right. they're not meant to travel well. They're right. meant to go from the oven to your plate and in your mouth in a very short period of time. So now you have to change your menus or you have to be conscious of your menus. You have to be conscious of to what... Point, I think the menu that we all used to know and love... Yep, yep, yep. That's a thing of the past. There's going to be either they'll be either completely disposable, i.e., you use it once, you'll get given it as a sheet of paper, and then it's destroyed. No more posh, uh, hard book bound covers that you're going to walk through, or, or, the, or it's going to be projected onto the wall or written onto the wall. Or, you know, I'll have a number 37, a number 22, and a number one. Yeah, quick serve. Yeah. I don't think necessarily, think necessarily be quick serve. I just think it will be very touchless. You know, absolutely. You know, maybe well, maybe, the, maybe the wine list is on one wall and the, the starters are on another wall and the main courses are on another wall. Yeah. I mean, just think about this concept, right? Let's say you and me go out to eat in a restaurant in June and we eat out two nights in a row. 
If we, if you and me go out night one and the first restaurant, restaurant A gives us a disposable menu. When the menu's done, you see them crumple it and throw it in the trash. Then we go out the next night and you see them take a menu from one table, give it to another table. You and me are going to go, we're done. But that's nothing we would have never thought about six months ago. Absolutely. So that's, I think the psychology of how you're delivering your message and how consumers are receiving the message yeah. is going to be the number one driving factor in how the success of the restaurant industry comes. Right. And, and I think the, 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 I agree with you totally. And I think there would be a part of it, a part of people's thinking that the quality of the food will almost be a given. You know, I, I mm-hmm. accept that you're a good chef and you're a good restaurant, you serve good food. It's the other factors now that are going to define whether I either come and yep. or stay at, at your restaurant. And you can even argue, you know, some, t- some people, not everyone, especially in Southwest Florida, you know, there's a lot of restaurants that are five-star caliber restaurants that they're expensive for maybe the everyday diner, right? You're a little pricier. But at this point in time, you can even justify your value. You can justify your price. You might even be able to charge more because you're guaranteeing that this experience is something that you don't have to be concerned about from the moment you walk in the door to the moment you leave your restaurant. And that's important. Right. I couldn't, couldn't agree with you more. I, 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 I'll share with you that I'm saying to my clients, uh, the coronavirus effect uh, is never going to go away. I think it's going to affect the economy heavily for at least the next 18 months to two years. I think the businesses that are successful uh, will be the ones that embrace all of the things like in the the hospitality arena that you were just talking about. The ones that are going to be successful are the ones that start to embrace all of the suggestions that you've just made and more, uh, i.e. mass gathering protocols um, uh, earlier rather than wait to be forced to do it. I think... Yes. And what I can say to that, and it's, it's, I thought at first when I heard this, it was a terrible example, but then after I digested it, I thought it made perfect sense. 9-11, right? When 9-11 happened, still to this day, how we travel, you know, TSA, you know, um, just how we have taken flying has changed forever. Ever. And I think that COVID-19, like you're saying, is one of those things that's going to change hospitality forever. Because, I mean, 9-11 happened, you know, in the United States, but it affected the world. This affected the world. Yep. So it, if, you're, if you're a restaurateur out there, or if you're anyone in any business, and you're not considering how this is going to change for the long haul, then you are already behind on your business plan. Agreed. So, um, let, let's finish with a bit of fun, Raphael. Let, let's, I'm going to ask you a few short, if you've, anybody that watched uh, our regular viewers will know that I always ask a few uh, straight from the hip, quick fire questions to our guests and uh, to try and find out a little bit more about them. Uh, so number one, does Raphael, do you want to be in charge or do you want to be in control? Oof. Uh, I want to be in control. All right. Okay. What's your greatest extravagance? What's your biggest treat ever been? My what? Your, Sorry? your greatest extravagance. The thing that you've that you treated yourself to. New car, new house, new whatever. I, uh, <laughs> I have this thing. I love shoes. Okay. Um, I'm a big shoe guy. I've been a shoe guy my whole life. When I was younger, I was into sneakers and Jordans. And then now that I became older and I wear suits every day, I have, you know, dress shoes and boots and... I've paid it. There's a pair of shoes that um, <laughs> these Ferragamos that I always wanted that I paid probably an ungodly amount that I wanted to, <laughs> but I did it because I said, I, in my mind, I psyched myself out and I said, I said, well, I'm going to wear it a lot. Uh, it's this, it's that, you know, the excuses you make yeah, when you buy a material yeah. item, but I paid way more for a pair of shoes that I probably, I'm not, I don't feel bad about it, but I do understand if that's not your thing, you would look at that price and go. That's, that's all good, right? Uh, favorite cocktail? Oh, uh, bourbon neat. I don't, I don't like mixed stuff. I like bourbon neat, stag, two drops of water every time. There we go. Least favorite business word? <sighs> Least favorite business word? Uh, can't. 
not, don't, any of those negative words. I don't like hearing that. There's solutions to all problems. Most favorite business word? Most favorite business word. Yes. <laughs> Least no favorite yes. <laughs> what profession other than the one that you're in now would you most, would you like to be in or would you like to try? I, I would have loved to be a, uh, a psychologist for sports athletes. Okay. Wow. I never saw that one coming. I, I never I, saw that one coming. I, I used to, you know, I, I used to be a ball player. Right. I, I think sports correlates a lot to business yeah. in those pressure situations. Yeah. And, and I always like, I always, when I'm in a pressure situation, I think I thrive in it because of what I've done in sports. Right. So I, I, at any level, I think it's so interesting to get into the psyche of the high caliber athletes and really what separates the bar. Right. Last question. So if, if you could pick anybody to connect with who's watching, who's watching this uh, episode today, anybody, king, queen, famous restaurant owner, famous chef, anybody, who would you want to give you a call and reach out to you that's watching this? Who do you want to watch it and reach out to? Well, and it has nothing to do with politics, but who wouldn't want to uh, like talk to President Trump and go like, what's going on, man? Like, what, <laughs> like, what, what are we doing right now? Like, what's the future hold? I would like, I mean, and, and I wouldn't even want to talk red, blue. I would just want to talk like, what's going on? Give me, give me your psyche right now. Donald, give him a call. Don't mess yeah. it up. Pick up the phone. Give Raphael a call now. All yeah, right. Please. All right. That's it. Raphael, if, if anybody wants to, uh, entrepreneur, business owner, restaurant owner, anybody in the hospitality sector, if they want to get in touch with you and talk to you about what they've got going on, how can they reach you? Uh, I mean, the best thing, if you want to, if you want to reach us through our company, uh, Food Idea Group, all social media platforms, also our website, I'm very active on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Um, I'm very accessible. You can DM me um, and I'm glad to talk to anyone. Even right now, we're, we're working with a lot of people as a company and I'm working with a lot of people that has nothing to do with money. It's just right now, we're all just trying to figure things out together. Just, just and to I think that, you know, you shake one hand, you know, you, you, you help one other and it'll come back to you. In, or in, not shake one hand as the case may yeah, be, right? Yeah, if you, if you shake you. one elbow or shake another elbow I back. hear you, I hear you. Raphael, thanks very much. That's it. 30 minutes, in fact, more than 30 minutes. We've overrun. It's been a great show. 30 minutes of business banter and badinage have gone. Thanks to uh, Raphael Feliciano from the Food Ideas Group for joining us as our guest. Thank to, thanks to G-Team and uh, thanks to Guerrilla Media for making all of this happen. Thank you for watching and for listening. And don't forget, please visit Tima's Video Vault of Wisdom at thirdeyemanagement.com where we share all the other Tima Talk episodes uh, which give you strategies and tactics on how to grow your business. So until the next time, as always, I want you to stay safe. I want you to stay happy. I want you to stay in touch. But most of all, I want you to stay positive. And with that, this is Carl Gibbons and we are out. Thank you.